As the Book of Boba Fett aired every week on a Wednesday, I was left with disappointment and frustration. But then Peacemaker arrived every Thursday to be a necessary palate cleanser. Yes! <gasps> Where Fett introduced character after character but very little characterization, Peacemaker gave time to all of its characters and made sure we cared before the bullets flew. How are you? Where Fett buckled under the weight of trying to be a seven hour movie level event, Peacemaker doubled down on the fact it was a TV show. Where Fett treaded water and stuffed itself full of superfluous scenes, Peacemaker made every second count with an intriguing mystery behind its big bad and plenty of information revealed with each new episode. Where Fett delivered action spectacle that bored me to tears, Peacemaker got brutal. <laughs> But my favourite thing about Peacemaker the show is not the great writing, or the wealth of characters, or the fantastic action, it is the casting of John Cena as Peacemaker. Oh, that's the real John Cena! Now, and obviously he was cast as Peacemaker for the Suicide Squad, but by the time you come to the end of Peacemaker the show, I think you get such a better, more well-rounded view of that character that it has cemented it, at least for me, as my favourite comic book casting. Heavyweight problems need heavyweight solutions. <laughs> because he both has the insanely huge cartoon physique of what we think superheroes are, but also it comes packaged with a vulnerability and a sadness, but also a humour that just makes him a character that fires on all cylinders. It is both hilarious and heartbreaking to go on Chris Smith's journey, and I can't wait for season two to see more of this character and his list of supporting characters. Where the hell are you supposed to be? Um. Today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering awesome boxes of top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and every month members get introduced to cool new products like outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing and more. Your items are tailored to you based on a preference quiz you fill out. The box lineup is constantly changing each month and you can even preview your box before it's shipped. Based on your preferences you'll get a box assigned to you and before it's shipped you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you'd like to one keep it, two swap it for a different box or three skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. If you're a cocktail kind of guy, you'll probably love the Alchemy Box, which contains a variety of things perfect for experimenting with at-home elixirs. Maybe you'll finally perfect the old fashioned. I personally like the Weekender, which has a fits all carrying bag, perfect for a weekend trip for the boys. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter FullFat20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash FullFat20. He's a dark creature of the night! He's a jackass! John Cena's wrestling background gives him an Arnold-esque physique, which is larger than life and just looks fantastic in a costume that is designed to accentuate all of his massive muscles. He looks like the classic archetype of the strongman action hero and the square-jawed superhero. He looks like how people would draw a cartoony Superman or Captain America. So his exaggerated look is something that I don't think has really been captured before in live action media in quite such a way. When you see him sat down with his like back and his like and his, and his biceps bulging, he literally looks like he was drawn by like Frank Miller and he should exist in like the Dark Knight Returns or something. He looks so wamp. Um, and it's just, it's just so cool to see that. The janitor in the first episode is right. Most superheroes have more of a gymnast body. Obviously, you know, a lot of the Marvel Studios heroes have these massive arms and shoulders to make them look so superheroic, but they really have quite like lean physiques. Um, whereas Cena is just fucking huge. Um, so it's so cool to see like, essentially like the crimson chin, Mr. Incredible look in live action in a way that we've never seen before. That's kind of why it's my favourite casting in one way. Because whenever I just see him on screen, it just puts such a smile on my face. It's like it's literally a comic book come to life with that casting. But then of course, you can't just have the visuals. You need the story as well. With 
eight wonderful scripts delivered by James Gunn, John Cena has a lot to work with here. And he takes his acting to new places that I'd not seen before or thought he was possibly capable of. I liked him in things like Bumblebee and that firefighters comedy thing he did. You remember, right? I don't know. Remember when it was thought that wrestlers couldn't make good actors? I'm glad that's been well and truly squashed. Wrestlers are more like athletes who already live and breathe a very exercise heavy lifestyle, rather than necessarily an actor who has been trained up in six months and pumped full of Marvel Studios roids. That's not a dig, they all do it, but wrestlers also have the showmanship. They're working actors who have to perform on stage. So whilst some of them might turn in some exaggerated performances less tailored to the screen, Ah, uh, my day just got a whole hell of a lot better. Ah, uh, could we do that take again? Some of them have far more range. John Cena totally has that range. This <laughs> guy's gonna be a friend, but you push away like you push everybody away because you're a fucking dick. And I was a bad friend, eagerly. The only one besides Keith that ever loved me for real was Charlie. Oh, God, he an angel. Looks like he's been slacking. What's it's worth? Maybe it's 50 cents, but maybe it's a million bucks. Break the old fuck! You hey, piece Dad. of shit! You dumb fuck! You killed your brother! You killed him, you dumb fuck! You okay in there? John Cena plays it with an almost childlike sense of vulnerability. He really grows up across the season, leaving behind the perfect image of his father, discovering emotional truths he had never thought about before. This is a man who is fully responsible for his actions and has to take culpability for them, but we're also given a window into the abuse that shaped him and pushed him down this path. It honestly breaks my heart to watch him burst into tears, but I guess that's because it's trading on not only a great performance, but some very emotionally charged story information. Discovering the fate of Chris's brother and seeing firsthand the cold, loveless relationship he has with his father paints a crushing picture. Chris does everything he can to earn some sort of affection from his father and skirts around his overt xenophobia at every turn in a desperate effort to keep him. Aside from Eagley, his father is all he has at the start of the show. Cena makes a nasty, unflinching instrument of evil in the Suicide Squad, a flawed, sometimes even good, anti-hero in Peacemaker. His relationship to Eagley is also interesting because it's not an arc. When we first meet the fresh out of the Suicide Squad Peacemaker in episode 1, he's still just as much of a piece of shit as we met before, but it turns out he has always harboured a purely selfless love for his pet animal, a single shining light in an abusive home, and I think a signifier that Chris Smith has always had a lot of love to give the world, hidden behind his father's puppeteering. He cites Eagley and his lost brother Keith as the only people that have ever truly loved him in episode 7. Fuck me man, that's just sad. When Smith plays Motley Crue's Home Sweet Home on the piano, that really is Cena playing, and is actually based on a real life interaction between him and Gunn. While we were shooting the Suicide Squad in Panama, I got word my dog of nearly 17 years was about to pass away. It was one of the saddest days of my life. I decided to fly home for a day to be with him. I sat in the hotel lobby bar with John waiting to be taken to the airport. John got up and sat at the grand piano and played the most beautiful rendition of the Pixies Where Is My Mind. It crushed me and yet soothed me and everyone around me was crying. I wanted to capture some semblance of that moment with this song. Chris Smith is an artist who has been decimated by his world. He's been decimated by who his parents are, what his surroundings are and the entire culture he's been brought up in. This is not to say that he is not culpable, he is, but he is emotionally mute, unable to express himself. I think when he's playing the piano here it is the first time we've really seen him. Everything else has been noise and drama and puffery. Peacemaker, access John Cena archives. John Cena has fulfilled more Make-A-Wish Foundation wishes than any other celebrity. Wow, really? Peacemaker might be awesome, but the whole team excels. Adrian Chase's Vigilante is awesome. He's kind of got a bit of a Deadpool vibe. What? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that that douchebag guy from, from In Between Us 2? It is, it's Ben. I'm not gonna lose. Oh my God. I can't lose, we'll see about that. Oh my God, Freddie Stromer is a chameleon. That is, that is insane. I cannot believe that Party Thor, the original Party Thor, Trust Fund's Party Thor, um, 
turned into vigilante. Beautiful. Well, that's an interesting story. Adebayo, Harcourt, Mern, Economist, they're all fantastic characters. None of them are purely good heroes. They all come with their caveats and unlikable traits, but that just makes us love them even more. By the end of the show, they feel like a real concerted team, and I can't wait to see where they go off next. Also, R.I.P. Mern. Nothing you can do will oh. make me. Mern's death is one of the most interesting moments in the show because when the head butterfly murders Mern in her hand and crushes him in his alien form. You could have just joined us. Her fellow butterfly is distraught and, and and cannot believe that she murdered him. You murdered him. And it's so funny to see them go on such a rampage across America throughout the show, possessing everyone, uh, only for them to have such compassion for their own kind. Uh, but then, of course, Peacemaker, in a later episode, says that he doesn't want to kill people, and he's had this big moral epiphany, but also, he doesn't mind killing the butterflies, that's completely different. No, I'm fine killing aliens, especially the bug ones. So it's really nice to have all those contrasts there, even the butterflies have more going on than just like something that is purely evil. In fact, the only exception that proves this rule of the characters is Peacemaker's dad, the Peace 1000. He is not morally grey. There is no nuance to him. He is a pure force of evil and hatred and bigotry in Chris Smith's life. And part of the story is Chris realising that through Adebayo, through Harcourt, through the team, through his own experiences, that this is not someone he can ultimately look up to and love, even if they are his father. I really thought James Gunn got a lot of mileage out of Toxic Parents in both Guardians Volume 1 and 2, and The Suicide Squad, and I didn't think he could push it any further, but lo and behold, The Peace 1000. Oh my god. What a character. <laughs> You hit like a girl. The other thing this show did better than Boba Fett is the cameos. Because the show was not reliant on the Justice League turning up at the end, and when Adebayo calls her mum, you don't actually expect the Justice League to turn up. So it's a wonderful surprise that you're genuinely not expecting, and just when you thought the Justice League were only going to show up in Shadow, which was cool enough, for a loosely connected DCU spin-off, we actually see Jason Momoa and The Flash, played by the Snyderian actors Jason Momoa and Ezra Miller. A lot of people were pissed off that Cyborg and Batman weren't included, and yeah, that totally sucks, but hand some credit to James Gunn here, he tried to get the full Snyder set into Peacemaker to keep them alive and well in some form, Gunn and Snyder and Momoa have been friends for years. I don't think there's any animosity there, so directing your hate at James Gunn and not WB is just silly. There's proof online from other stunt doubles that James Gunn filmed Batman and Cyborg and wanted them to be in the final cut. Plus, the fish jokes, fucking funny, who gives a shit? Jason Momoa doesn't give a shit, so you shouldn't give a shit. He's gonna own in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom anyway. It was a much more tasteful cameo because it didn't matter if the cameo happened or not. That's what cameos should be. A little cherry on top, a little bit of icing on the cake. They shouldn't be the filling in between that makes the cake so delicious and end up you end up like just eating through the sponge to get to the creamy filling. That's what Boba Fett is, basically. Adebayo is the other half to the heart of the show. As well as daughter, her story mirrors Peacemakers in a lot of ways and reveals interesting facets to her character. It is always easier to see flaws in other people whilst buying into your own lies. She, like Chris, hides behind the better, more innately good version of her mother in her head. She can see how Chris is used by his father, but not her own mother's machinations. She suspects Peacemaker has racist tendencies, but still shows him kindness. She is heroic to a fault and always aware of the cost of human life in stark contrast to Amanda. But she also has flaws and does shitty things. Oh, inside my mind, I'm not supposed to be giving a speech, but sometimes my mouth just does what it wants. The awkward babble in episode one is endearing, but hiding the diary is a dick move. Her lesbian relationship isn't a blink and you'll miss it cameo that can be easily edited out for certain territories. No, this relationship, whilst not given a whole lot of screen time, genuinely factors into Adebayo's ongoing conflict within the group. Is she made for this? 
Peacemaker is also 100% bisexual in this. I think it was fine the way it was done in Loki, but I do see Russell T Davies' point about those kind of reveals. When we literally see Peacemaker in bed with another man, and later his homophobic father confirms it, I knew when you slept with the whores that polluted blood and men! It not only makes Chris's sexuality an intrinsic part of his story, but it provides a massive cathartic payoff when he finally stands up to the Peace 1000. But we all know what he's done to you. You don't know shit! I knew you couldn't do it, you faggot. Because I control you. Well, we all want to believe that our parents are flawed but innately good, and maybe, usually, that's the case. And you're only right about one thing, I am a piece of shit! But not here. Your dad is not a good man. I'm a piece of shit for listening to you for all those years! I'm a piece of shit for not killing you in your sleep! You'll never be able to get the fuck away from me. Side note, I got to briefly meet Robert Patrick at a Comic Con in London a few years back and it was honestly one of the best interactions I've ever had with anyone remotely famous. He dropped a bunch of zingers and my friend and I were obviously excited to talk about the T-1000s. He promised to run after us and kill us. It was fucking awesome. Activate 1 million views. Activate 1 million views. Activate 1 million views. Other wrestlers have or are about to play superheroes, but I don't think all the ingredients have ever been there like they all are in Peacemaker the show. The Rock has got the superhero physique that is truly larger than life, but he ain't got the range that Cena and Dave Batista have. And in terms of Batista, well, maybe he could have been my favourite comic book casting for all the reasons I've listed for Cena, and he's probably an even better actor in my opinion. His superhero moniker Drax the Destroyer hasn't been given nearly enough to do. Drax has been sidelined a lot since his first appearance in 2014, even barely having anything to say or do against Thanos, the one responsible for murdering his family. Of course, Ronan was only a puppet. It's really Thanos I need to kill. Plus, he gets his ass kicked way too much. Batista even said he gets his ass kicked more than any other Marvel character, and I really think that's true. Most characters at least get one or two hero moments. Drax just gets punked all the time, man. Hopefully Love and Thunder in Volume 3 not only gives him more emotional scenes to work with, but more ass kicking too. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I think since 2021, DC have been killing it. Whether or not you're a fan of Zack Snyder, the fact that they did finally release a four hour cut of a superhero movie that is R rated and in a 4 3 format is pretty cool. They then followed that up with James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, which was accidentally the best superhero blockbuster of 2021. Then they followed that up with Peacemaker, and we're about to get the Batman. I'm actually going tonight as of filming this, so I'm very excited. And even things like Black Adam, which will probably be like the Fast and Furious of the DCEU, I'm pretty hyped for. I think it's going to be ridiculous. I think Pierce Brosnan is incredible casting as Dr. Fate, and I do like The Rock for the fast and furious fun that he delivers. There's a glorious world out there. Waiting for you. And then The Flash, I think people are really sleeping on. I don't think it's gonna erase Snyder per se. I think it's gonna be a fun movie with time travel and alternate universes. And I like the casting of Ezra Miller as The Flash. You can go to any timeline, any universe. Why'd fight to save this one? I think Michael Keaton as Batman's gonna kill it, and I don't think it's gonna be as reliant on that Disney formula of cameos coming in in the third act a la No Way Home. I think Michael Keaton is gonna be a fully fledged character in this, and I'm very excited for that. Also, Andy Muschietti made It Chapter One and Two, and even though the second film's a mixed bag, I think both of them are really awesome and very director driven, and he has a clear vision for genre stuff, so I honestly think it's gonna be really fun. And then, of course, Mr. James Wan, Aquaman 2, we know it's going to be good, baby. We know it's going to be a good time. 
What could be greater than a king? DC are honestly killing it, and I'm far more excited for everything DC is doing this year than Marvel. And that is a weird thing to say, given the past couple of years. But above all else, you know, you got your Chris Evans, you got your Robert Downey Juniors, you got your Michael Keatons, your Christian Bales. But the casting of John Cena as Peacemaker is the most awesome comic book casting I have ever seen. And I think his character has risen up the depths of D-list DC uh, <laughs> hero slash villains slash anti-heroes to become one of my favourite DC characters. I cannot wait to see what's going to happen next. I also hope that John Cena gets more exciting roles off the back of this because he absolutely deserves it and he could more than carry an action film like Bullet Train, which by the way looks awesome. I'm very excited for that. I guess the next time you'll see me will be after the Batman. Activate theatre going experience. A big thank you to my full fat tier patron, Dr. Chike. If you'd like to donate money to my Patreon, you can find me at patreon.com slash fullfatvideos. If you'd like to find me on Instagram, you can find me at full underscore fat underscore videos. And if you'd like to find me on Twitter, you can find me at, you guessed it, at fullfatvideos.